situation. He took a pitch in the back. He got beat for crying out loud. We used heart attack. Managers on a major league baseball team don't make decisions. Credibility in this situation is worse than losing your job. Was it over when the Chairman's Bob Pro Armor? The castration of the Major League Baseball managers, we know it. Ask me about my winner. What's going on, everybody? Another edition of the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by St. Alwish's Church in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of people can say that they're experts when it comes to the world of football, but who saw the Deshaun Watson to the Cleveland Browns thing happening? Now, listen, I think you could have said one half of it could have made sense and the other half of it could have made sense. Deshaun Watson most likely was going to be out and playing for another football team the next game that he played for in the NFL. And at some point, the Browns were going to make a decision to move on from Baker Mayfield. But, you know, to make both of them kind of happen at the same time, you look at what the Browns did to seem like they were supportive of Baker Mayfield, seemed like they were all in on Baker Mayfield as far as being their quarterback for the next series of years trading Odell Beckham, moving on from Jarvis Landry. I think supporting him when he had a down season last year, but most importantly, seeming to be willing to bet on a Baker Mayfield at full strength, being the best answer to lead the Cleveland Browns going forward. These were all things that were expected right up until the moment that you find out that the Browns are trading for Deshaun Watson. And obviously, they're not going to have Deshaun Watson and Baker Mayfield playing for the same team. Now, listen, there's a small possibility that the Browns hold on to Baker Mayfield as the NFL decides uh, what type of penalty, if anything, to levy towards Deshaun Watson. Um, obviously, there was some unfavorable or unprofessional uh, uh, acts going on. Deshaun Watson is guilty of something, but there was not, not enough evidence to prove that he was guilty of anything in a court of law. And you know, the NFL, um, along the same lines as Major League Baseball and the NBA and the NHL, really has a no tolerance policy when it comes to the acceptance of any support of a, any so, sort of abuse or domestic violence as it exists from their athletes. It's likely that Deshaun Watson is gonna start the 2022 NFL season on the sidelines. And because of that, the Browns are going to have high expectations. It's likely the expectations are going to be that the Browns are going to, as I fuck this up again, but the, the Browns are going to be expected to compete right off the bat, you know, from day number one, game number one. And within that, the expectations is going to be that they're going to have to have somebody under center that's going to give them a favorable chance to win. And if Deshaun Watson is not playing, then that means that Baker Mayfield, it might very well be an option to be the quarterback for this team. Now there's the other side of it, which explains, hey, the trade for Deshaun Watson, especially giving up what you gave up. You gave up five picks, three first rounders to, to make something like this happen means it's going to come in conjunction with a Baker Mayfield trade. And obviously the core quarterback carousel as it exists in the NFL, which you know has been spinning and spinning. And you know, pretty much since the second that I threw some cold water on it, you know, and it seemed reported that Aaron Rodgers was staying in Green Bay. And there was some likeliness, at least in regards to the um, cord cordiality between the Seattle Seahawks and Russell Wilson um, if those two quarterbacks weren't moving, you weren't going to see as many moving parts. Now, all of a sudden, Russell Wilson got traded. Deshaun Watson ends up in Cleveland. Carson Wentz moves from Indianapolis to Washington. There's a lot of teams that are looking for quarterbacks right now. And I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about the Indianapolis Colts because the Colts, to me, look like they're a, a quarterback away from winning a Super Bowl. And I'm quoting the great owner. Uh, you know, maybe a great is a little bit too harsh of a word. And, you know, if, unless you're really seeing a sarcasm that I'm throwing out there and throwing your way as I'm saying it. 
but the the owner of the Houston Oilers, Bud Adams, when he said the 1979 Houston Oilers are quarterback away from being able to win a Super Bowl. In other words, an indictment of Dan Pastorini, who was the quarterback for almost a decade for that team. Of course, there was a trade of Pastorini to the Oakland Raiders for Ken Stabler, and the Oilers didn't win with Ken Stabler either. He, uh, head coach Bum Phillips was fired, and that organization just kind of took a dump up until Warren Moon came from the USFL, and then, I'm sorry, the CFL, I apologize, in the mid-1980s. Now, the reason I say this is because I look at the Indianapolis Colts and I kind of feel the same way. Ever since Andrew Luck abruptly announced his retirement, probably at the most inopportune time for the Colts and their franchise, they finally built themselves an offensive line. They invested a lot in the draft. They really had their salary cap situation with the quality of players that they had ready to go out there and win a Super Bowl. And they thought the one thing they could depend on was they're off injured, but off injured for a reason because the Colts failed to protect him, quarterback Andrew Luck. And it seems like ever since Andrew Luck left, the Colts have been a quarterback away. Jacoby Brissett, the first season. All right, probably wasn't a bad placeholder. And certainly when they went out there and they got themselves Phillip Rivers for the next season, you know, the question was going to be with Phillip Rivers, how long was he going to play? And obviously, he was a cast-off in spite of having a Hall of Fame career with the San Diego Chargers, who were the Los Angeles Chargers at the time. But they usher in this new era with their new quarterback and Justin Herbert, who you could very well make a case as the best quarterback in the NFL in regards to pure ability and talent. I, I, I would argue Pat Mahomes. I would argue Aaron Rodgers. But in regards to up-and-comers, somebody that over the time can end up overtaking the mantle and being the number one quarterback in the National Football League, I certainly would believe that Justin Herbert has the best chance of becoming that. Now, Philip Rivers retires after one year. They go out there, they trade for Carson Wentz. Made, you know, listen, gave up some, some assets, some draft assets to the Eagles to get themselves Carson Wentz. It didn't work out after one year. Now, I don't think it would be a good move for the Colts to invest themselves in Baker Mayfield. Not that Baker Mayfield can't be a sturdy NFL quarterback for the next 10 years for somebody. I believe that. I don't. I just don't believe that when you're a quarterback away, that's the guy you go out there and get. Who, by the way, is developing a reputation of himself as being a cast-off. The Browns don't want him anymore. They wanted Deshaun Watson. They went all in for Deshaun Watson. They traded five draft picks, including three first-rounders, to get themselves Deshaun Watson. That's how much they think of Baker Mayfield. Now, ideally, they're going to be able to flip them somewhere. They're going to be able to get some draft assets back. Probably, maybe not a number one. I don't think a number one. I'd be surprised if they got a number one. If they could get a number one draft pick, a first-round draft pick for Baker Mayfield, I'd say they, they make the deal before the other team could reconsider. What teams are out there looking for a quarterback now? Like I said, it's not a good idea if you're the Indianapolis Colts. I think you want more of a sure thing. Jimmy Garoppolo makes a lot more sense if you're looking to put somebody under center and usher in a new era and have the expectations that you're going to go out there and win the AFC South and make a run in the postseason. Um, are there other quarterbacks on the move? Sure. You know, Seattle's looking for a quarterback, right, because they traded Russell Wilson. You know, you mentioned the Colts. You look at some of the other teams in the NFL that I don't know if they're going to be able to fulfill their positions through the draft because – you're not looking at a very strong quarterback draft. But because of that, because of the need, position scarcity, especially on a big stage, there's going to be quarterbacks that are going to be drafted in the first round, especially in the day and age we live in now. I'd be surprised if we ever made it through a first round in an NFL draft again without a team selecting a quarterback in the first round. And that's regardless of the dearth or the amount of talent that exists at the position of the college level. Because there's a dream that exists, that every team in the National Football League is dreaming of selecting that next Aaron Rodgers, that next Tom Brady in the sixth round. You know, and, and it's not so easy, but it happens. And because it happens, there's teams that are going to believe. They're going to believe a lot of what they see on the NFL Combines. There's going to be a lot that they believe in regards to reading the Todd McShays and the 
Mel Kuypers in regards to their evaluation process when it comes to the upcoming high, uh, college players. There's going to be enough hype that's out there that a team's going to take a chance. And the question is, when do you take a chance? And when you have so many teams in the NFL that don't have a definitive number one quarterback, then you, you see teams start to guess and start to say, hey, maybe in the first round we select this guy, this player will be the, the guy of the future. Pittsburgh Steelers, Mitch Trubisky didn't play much last year, sad under Josh Allen with the Buffalo Bills. They're taking a chance that Mitch Trubisky learned enough in one year uh, with a track record of taking the Chicago Bears to the playoffs, maybe is on his way. It's going to be interesting to see the way this folds out, but there's a huge wrinkle in a whole quarterback carousel with Watson going to the Browns because now Baker Mayfield is going to be going somewhere. Like I said, there's a minute chance if the NFL says Deshaun Watson is spent, suspended for the 2022 season, which I think it would be too harsh of a penalty. I don't think there's enough evidence that the NFL could come up with to be able to suspend him for that long. But you're looking at some time he's going to miss. Four games, six games, eight games. I don't know. I would lean towards the uh, the former, let's say around four games, and say that that's legitimate, especially considering there wasn't any criminal charges filed against the man, and he didn't play last year. So it's already like you had a, a, a year off. Not suspended. It was a contract dispute. It was a fact that he didn't want to play for the Houston Texans, and a lot of it has to do, and I think it is racially motivated. I don't think there is a positive feeling when it comes to, to the Houston Texans and their ownership from the average black player in the National Football League. I think it impacted DeAndre Hopkins. You know, he spoke up. He was traded pretty quickly. You know, you look at the, the comments of the late owner, Bob McNair, saying the inmates are running to prison. You know, that's always going to be in the mind and in the head of the black player for the Houston Texans. So I don't disagree with his interest in wanting out. You know, he's missed a lot of time. And I wonder, and I'm going to conclude this point with this one very interesting thing to think about. Being out as long as Deshaun Watson was, does that compromise his ability and anything we can expect coming on the football field? So spring training games have already started in baseball. We've come a long way for the last, what, little over a week when it seemed like we weren't going to have baseball and all of a sudden there was an agreement and I'm not going to get into any of the specifics of the CBA. Uh, a lot of it's a rollover of the same one, but the bottom line is there's games that you're going to see here. There's still free agency going on in baseball players, you know, switching teams, whether it's Freddie Freeman to the Los Angeles Dodgers, Carlos Correa signing with the Minnesota twins. You're going to find out very soon what team Trevor story ends up in. The Philadelphia Phillies have been active, signing Kyle Schwarber and Nick Castellanos. The Washington Nationals signing Nelson Cruz. And I think they're in a position where they're expected to be a little bit better than the way they finished last year. And one team that you saw as far as winning the offseason prior to December 1st that has been relatively inactive in spite of making a big trade for Oakland Athletics pitcher Chris Bassett is the New York Mets. And I'm going to talk about this for a minute because I believe that the NL East got a lot better. It did. The Braves, who you thought was going to be addition by subtraction by them losing Freddie Freeman, well, Matt Olson is as good as Freddie Freeman. He's younger, and he's going to be around for a longer time. So I don't think you lost too much there. The Braves signed themselves Kenley Jansen. It seems like every time the Braves make a move, it's a wise and a shrewd move. The Philadelphia Phillies, I don't trust their pitching. I think their pitching is something that they really do have to think about. They signed themselves Brad Hand. Um, their depth outside of Aaron Nola. And you know, you'll, you'll really look at their starting rotation, and you say they're a little bit behind some of the others in baseball. And I think, I think it's worth thinking about for a minute because, you know, the Phillies are a playoff type of team. The only other team in the NL East that wasn't named the Atlanta Braves that finished over 500 last year. You look at Zach Wheeler, he was in the top three in regards to being, you know, the Cy Young. You know, there's Wheeler, there's Noah, there's Zach Eflin, and I don't know what you really can depend on after that. I think, I believe Kyler 
uh, Kyle Gibson's back for another year. But Gibson was one of those interesting pitchers that pitched really well in obscurities with an awful team, found himself traded at the trading deadline to a team that had higher expectation and he wasn't good for them. So I look at the Phillies, I don't believe in their pitching, but you gotta love their offense. An offense that already had Bryce Harper and JT Real Muto, and all of a sudden goes out there, makes the move, and they add themselves Kyle Schwarber and Nick Castellanos in an offensive ballpark in Philadelphia. Phillies, I think, are just as ready to compete for the NL East as the Mets. Now, you can talk about the Mets in their, what, four days or five or six days where they really went scorched earth on the free agent market, signed themselves, Eduardo Escobar and Mark Canna and Starling Marte and Max Scherzer, all seemingly in a matter of days, made the trade after the, after the lockout break to get themselves Chris Bassett, a solid number three starter with the with the Oakland Athletics last year. Certainly, you you put him behind Degrom and the, behind Scherzer. The, it doesn't get any better than that. But once again, when you're with the Mets and this, yes, this is probably 35 plus years as a Mets fan speaking out my own frustrations. But it always seems like the Mets paint this picture for you. And now it doesn't matter if it's the Will Ponds or if it's Steve Cohen or whoever the general manager is, or God forbid we give a shit of who the field manager is, because you know I don't. But it's always about, hey, if all these players click on all cylinders and everybody stays healthy, the Mets could be a really good baseball team. If Jacob DeGrom makes 30 starts, and Max Scherzer, by the way, didn't pitch in the NLCS for the Dodgers last year because of a dead arm. If he's at full strength making 30 starts, the Mets could be great. If Jeff McNeil rebounds from a really down season last year, the Mets could be great. If Mark Kana, who really up until the last year or so has been nothing more than a reserve player or a fourth outfielder, could emerge as an everyday player for the Mets, then the Mets could be pretty good. If James McCann, who basically performed at the level of a replacement level catcher, both offensively and defensively, maybe was a little better defensively than offensively, can perform to his very best, the Mets will be really good. And, you know, as a fan of a team that has made the postseason nine times in now 61 years, I'm tired of being compared to the Dodgers, who make the playoffs every year. I'm tired of this team being compared to the Yankees, who have won 27 World Series championships and 39 pennants. Because they don't operate the same way. They don't have the same type of expectation. If you're a fan of the Yankees, the expectation is that you're going to be in the playoffs every single year. And it's, what are you going to do when you get there? If you're a fan of the Dodgers, it's the same thing. The expectation is that the Dodgers are going to be in the playoffs every single year. It's not if you make it to the playoffs. And we're still in this state and age with the New York Mets where the expectation is, are they going to make the playoffs? It's supposed to be, if that, they're getting to the playoffs. It's what's going to happen once they get there. And they haven't built that up yet. They didn't do enough, even though they had a great pre-lockout offseason to put themselves in a position where you could think that they are the odds-on favor to win the NL East, let alone the National League. The Phillies are right up there with them. And honestly, if I'm if I'm like this, trying to pick one or the other, I take the Phillies offense and the Mets pitching. But I don't say, hands down, one's better than the other. The Braves are still a team to beat. Tell me that the Mets right now are better than the Atlanta Braves. I'll believe it when I see it. The division, sure, it's going to be strong. I think the Braves are going to be back to where they were last year. The Phillies are going to expect to be better. And the Nationals, at the very least, are going to expect themselves to be a 500 team. And that leaves the Marlins, who are two years removed from making the playoffs. And I know we're talking about the, the truncated Mickey Mouse 2020 pandemic-shortened baseball season. But this is a team that is expected to get better. Yes, they, maybe they're a free agent away. Michael Conforto's out there. If the Marlins sign Michael Conforto, 
Can you tell me that you think hands down the Mets are better than that Marlins team? I think well, they're a little bit better. But I don't think that they're going to win 95 games and the Marlins are going to lose 95 games. You're talking about a competitive division and a dogfight, which the Mets have set themselves up for. And I don't think they underestimated how far away they were from putting themselves in a position to be the premier team in the National League East, let alone the National League. So another division that I think is very slowly getting better. You're watching the American League Central, which has had the likes of the Tigers and the Twins. The Tigers have been doormats a little longer than the Twins. Twins have had a, a couple bad seasons, right? A bad season last year. Well, most notably, made the playoffs the year before. And we're expecting to be a team on the rise. Traded Jose Barrios. And now all of a sudden, they're in the mix. They Their expectations are higher. They made the trade with the Yankees. Dealing Josh Donaldson, but got themselves Gary Sanchez and J.L. Urshela. And then they ended up signing Carlos Correa in kind of a shocking and weird series of events. The expectation is the Twins are going to get better. Another team that is getting better, I think, is the Detroit Tigers. They signed Javier Baez. They signed Eduardo Rodriguez. They made a signing of Michael Pineda to kind of stabilize the back, the front end of their starting rotation. And they got a good manager in A.J. Hinch, which we saw last year. And this is a team that I think is getting better. You tell me the most competitive division in Major League Baseball, I'm going to go with the AL Central. I think the AL Central is slightly better than the AL West, which is slightly better than the AL East. And I'm going, if I go into National League, it's the NL East, the NL West. But the problem with the NL West is you still got the Rockies, even though they signed Chris Bryant. Yes, Chris Bryant's going to go have a Hall of Fame career there now, but they don't have really much else around them. They're looking at it as, as being a last place team. The Diamondbacks, we're not expected to be as bad as they were last year, but I, I, I don't really believe that they're going to make a huge movement in the right direction this year. Then you got the Giants, who I think are up for a little bit of a decline. 107 wins last year. Unexpected. I don't know if that's something that they can maintain. And you got the Dodgers and the Padres, two arguably of the best teams in Major League Baseball. And then you got the NL Central, which I think has the Pirates, who aren't trying. You got the Reds who you could tell by their offseason aren't trying. The Cubs did a little bit of reshuffling, and I think they're being given some belief that they got a chance in that division now because of the likes of the Pirates and the Reds and what they're doing. And then you got the Cardinals. Listen, uh, a gold standard franchise, always run correctly, always doing everything that they possibly can to build themselves as a winning organization going forward. And the team to beat in that division is the Milwaukee Brewers. And I love the signing of Andrew McCutcheon. You're talking about a clubhouse leader, but a solid ball player that leads by example. And you tell me you can find some way to get out from Jackie Bradley and what you're going to be paying him for the 2022 season. Get anything for him, which they did, by trading him back to the Red Sox and get Andrew McCutcheon. I think that's a win in its own right. And if you're looking at some of the best pitching in baseball, you might want to take a ride over to Miller Park and watch a Brewers game this year because they got a series of pitchers that not a lot of non-diehard baseball fans know a lot about. The Brandon, Brandon Woodruffs, the uh, Freddie Peraltas, the Corbin Burnses, which, by the way, he won a Cy Young this past year. Obviously, a bullpen that's strong. Devin Williams got him... You know, punched himself, punched the wall and broke his hand and couldn't pitch in the postseason last year. But he's a closer type. You obviously got Hayter, who's pitching, you know, at an elite level over the last three years. I'm going to put some uh, picks together as, uh, as I take my trip down to Florida next week. I'll put them in writing. We'll get that going uh, for the 2022 baseball season. This is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com. By St. Aloysius Church in Jackson, New Jersey. By Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck. Located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We're going to be right back at you. We're going to do a show on Monday, Monday morning. Talking about everything going on in the world of baseball and sports. So once again, this is John Pielli with the Past Ball Show. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.
heart attack. Lee. Managers on a Major League Baseball team don't make decisions. They don't know that. Yeah, credibility in this situation is worse than losing your job. Was it over with the Germans bomb pro honor? The castration of the Major League Baseball managers, we know it. Ask me about my winner. Chris Bryant was on the Chicago Cubs roster opening day. I have many leather-bound books. My apartment smells of rich mahogany. Why don't you give it all or a majority of it to the team that wins the freaking World Series? I was going to listen to that, but then I just carried on it in my life. Now they come out as the biggest Major League Baseball manager apologist. That'll only make someone work just hard enough not to get fired. Because hitters are going out there saying, I'm either going to hit a home run or I'm going to strike out. And if I don't get a pitch that I feel like I could drive out of the park, I was supposed to be here today. Especially prospect whores and hoarders are going to be a little pissed off at me when I say this. I'm a dude who's made a dude disguised as another dude. There are only two managers in baseball's Hall of Fame who have losing records. One of them is the iconic Tony Mack, who you could say, in spite of winning five World Series championships as a manager, could be in as much as a pioneer. And what side of the spectrum they're on? Were they pitching? Were they batting? If your favorite team was pitching and a ball got inside to hit a batter, there's no way it could have been on purpose. But if, if you were a fan of the team that was batting and a ball got inside and hit somebody or went behind somebody's head, absolutely 100% unequivocally, that pitcher was throwing at them. They put their tail between their legs and decided they're going to do exactly what they're told. Series of years. 35 years ago, I could have loaned your parents the money for an abortion. 